It is a pleasure to welcome back. I don't think uh, it's it's been years, but it is a, uh, a pleasure to welcome back uh, to the program Katha Pollitt. She is the award-winning columnist for The Nation magazine. The column is subject to debate and author. Uh, her most recent work is Pro Reclaiming Abortion Rights. Uh, Katha Pollitt, welcome to the program. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Sam. So, uh, you know, uh, this piece, I... I I really enjoyed this piece, and it, it, it's sort of a, I don't know, a perennial question as to why uh, gay marriage is winning and, and other sort of, I guess, left and progressive uh, uh, um, agendas are losing. Uh, your piece in The Nation uh, from, I guess it was last week now, there's a reason gay marriage is winning while abortion rights are losing. Um, Let's let's dig into that. You 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 talk about you you note that in Indiana, the attempt to uh, enshrine opposition to gay marriage uh, and it's sort of a, a the, the promulgation of this one of these religious freedom uh, bills was met with an incredible backlash and not just an incredible backlash. Uh, in in a vacuum, but also in the context of where gay rights were just like 15 years ago. Uh, it, it, it's pretty stunning. Just, I mean, talk about that change so that people get a sense of that, of just how sort of stunning that backlash really was. Oh, it's, uh, in Indiana, there was a huge backlash against uh, the new uh, Restoration of Religious Freedom Act, or whatever it's called, uh, the RIFRA, I say, uh, shorten it, um, that would allow um, people for religious reasons to discriminate uh, in various ways uh, in, uh, against gay people. It's not just about gay marriage, but it was, you know, the cases that came forward were things like, I'm a Christian baker, I don't want to make a cake for your wedding. Now the government is going to force me to make a cake for, cake for your wedding, and that violates my religious conscience. Um, there was a huge backlash against those arguments. Um, you had a lot of, uh, quite a few um, major corporations uh, threatening not to do business in the state. You had uh, one religious denomination threatening to move its convention. Um, and uh, it was quite, and, and all over the country, there was a huge um, uproar from, uh, you know, regular people. Um, it had very little support except uh, uh, in the Christian right itself. And, and so, and so let's, let's contrast that to what seems to happen, I mean, uh, on, a, on, a, on a fairly regular drumbeat, particularly since, I think, 2010 in particular, um, in the States in terms of rolling back uh, a woman's right to choose. Because, I, I mean, I think... You know, periodically I've done shows where uh, we've had uh, reporters on who have documented this, and it really is sort of a stunning list that we don't hear much about. Um, it's, it's so true, Sam, and this is what's uh, quite surprising, that all over the, not all over the country, but in, in the red states and in some other states as well, some purplish states, clinics are being forced to close by laws that uh, make it impossible for them to operate. Uh, women are being subject to all kinds of restrictions, have to jump through all kinds of hoops, to the extent where, just to give you one example, in Missouri, there is now one clinic. You know, and Missouri is not uh, North Dakota, a very low population state. And Missouri is big. And if you want an ab abortion now in Missouri, you have to go to St. Louis. You have to, you have to wait 72 hours so that means you might be driving across state, staying in this town, this city, for three days, which means you have to get a hotel, you have to take time off work, you have to put your children in, in some, have, find some sort of child care for them. It raises the cost of an abortion enormously, um, and it places it out of reach for a lot of people. Now, do you have major corporations saying, well, we're leaving Missouri. This shows such disrespect to our female employees. No. Um, you don't have people boycotting travel to Missouri or canceling their conventions. It's, a, it's completely different. It's sort of, oh, really? I didn't know that. Oh, right. well, that's not good. <laughs> the end, you know? 
Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. And I want to go through, I mean, that dynamic in and of itself is sort of fascinating to me. And I want to go through the distinctions that you make um, uh, between these two issues that is, that, that explains part of, or at least is, is, is part of your theory as to what explains the difference in reactions. I mean, it was interesting, um, uh, yesterday we had the prob, uh, the, on the program, we had, uh, Michelangelo Signorelli on the program talking about, uh, his, uh, his book, uh, entitled It's Not Over, making the argument that the, now is no time in terms of the marriage equality fight and, and sort of the broader gay rights fight to, um, to, to rest or to not press forward. And one of the things he cited in our conversation was, you know, look at what's happened to a woman's right to choose. Uh, mm -hmm. and because it was almost as if there was, there's almost, and, and I sort of, I mean, I feel that this, there's this sense of like, well, women have the right to choose, end of story. We don't really have to worry about it. And there's no awareness of, of how this is, this right is being attacked on a, a daily, but I mean, on a weekly, monthly basis. It's so true. Um, and not only that, I think that um, abortion is a stigmatized choice. Um, and that, I think, plays a part in it, too, that people think, yeah, I don't, you know, there are a lot of people, I talk about this in Pro, my book, that, you know, there are a lot of people, they don't want to see abortion banned, which is what the anti-abortion movement wants. They don't talk about that so much, but that's their end game, is no legal abortion. Um, and people don't support that. The vast majority of Americans support Roe v. Wade. Um, they want abortion to be more or less legal, but they don't feel good about it. And so each of these restrictions can be presented as something that, oh, well, now, now the whole thing is, oh, it's good for women. You know, we need to make clinics be like little hospitals. Um, we need to have the doctor have uh, admitting privileges at a hospital, even though the hospital won't give <laughs> admitting privileges, uh, because that's what keeps women safe. Well, you know, this is nonsense, but it, 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 it lets people sort of think, yeah, abortion is kind of creepy. We want women to be safe. We, you know, maybe they should be forced to wait and see an ultrasound and get some, you know, biased state legislature written quote, counseling, unquote, from a doctor, you know, stuff like, like that. Are, are those two different things? I mean, because I think, like, uh, to a certain extent, when you talk about the argument where you say that, you know, and, and this is one of the first distinctions that you, you, you write in your piece, um, that marriage equality is about love, romance, commitment, settling down, starting a family, reproductive rights, by contrast, is about sex, sexual freedom, sort of the, uh, the opposite of marriage. And it, 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 it's interesting because... It, when I contemplate an opponent to marriage equality, um, they are vehemently opposed to it. When I think about someone who is supportive, the idea of like someone saying like, I think there should be a right for marriage equality, but I think that I don't want to see too much of it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. nobody says yeah. I'm, I'm okay with gay people getting married, but I just don't want to, I just think that we need to minimize it. Like that, that, that equation, right? Like, right. No, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. And I think, you know, they're constructed a little differently. We think, we generally think marriage is great, you know? Yes. And marriage is also a socially conservatizing force. Um, and I think that's one reason people like it, that, that the old image of gays think back to before marriage equality was a thing before it was even called marriage equality, back when it used to be gay marriage, you know, the image of gays was terrible. It was that they were promiscuous, they were child molesters, lesbians were lonely gym teachers, um, these people were a threat to normal life. Um, and that has changed completely. Um, and marriage nobody... is almost like you, you, could, uh, you could perceive it. I mean, if you start off with that image of who gays and lesbians are, this is almost like reparative. Right. So this is like gays and lesbians are now your neighbors who buy pottery barn furniture um, and adopt children and are inviting you over to barbecue. It's completely different. Um, nobody talks about going to bathhouses anymore and stuff like that. That used to be that used to be the thing. Um, so uh, I think marriage, you know, people can see it as a taming force. Right. Um, and also marriage is completely optional now. I mean, there are, you know, it's 
from the point of view of marriage, the institution there really is really lucky that gay, gays and lesbians are getting married because so many other people are not. Um, reproductive rights is constructed completely differently. For one thing, it it well it allows sex without punishment. We don't like that idea. Um, you know, when people say, you know, don't use abortion, abortion as birth control, you should be responsible. That's what they're talking about. They're saying, um, you know, all that sex is really a bad idea. Right. Um, and the idea that women should pay for pleasure is very, very deep in our culture. The whole, you know, that whole, the whole use of the word slut all the time that shows you that. Well, and I mean, the fact and, that there and, is no such thing as a male slut, and it's not just a question of, of perception, right? I mean, uh, when you when you exercise your choice to have an abortion, it is you are sort of like uh, it is it is a, a a a an act that is sort of like you're fixing something on some level, right? I mean, it's like it's I, I'm I, I'm going back to a state where it, it's it is. It's a it's a reaction, right? An abortion obviously uh-huh. is a reaction, as right. opposed to, you know, I I have to get married because it's you know if marriage was just about let's say getting citizenship, then it would be, it would be perceived differently. I mean, I and I agree that the the real um, animus towards abortion is a function of like we can't have women having sex and then just being able to not have the face the consequence of it. I definitely think that that is, and we can see that within the context of, of, of contraception. But, but there is a sort of like, there is something different. It's not, uh, the, the, the quality of it is, is different in terms of an abortion is a response to something as opposed to marriage is, I guess it's a response to being in love, but it's, um, uh, it, it's not as, hmm, it, it doesn't, it, it's, it's just a different, I think, sort of like a dynamic. It is a little bit of a different dynamic, but, and but what my, what my piece was trying to do is, and we always talk about, uh, abortion and marriage equality as, you know, as, uh, aspects of the culture war, their cultural right. issues. I hate this. Um, and then we we get once we put them together under that same umbrella, we become puzzled as to why abortion rights are, uh, you know, in such trouble and equal mar- equal marriage equality is going forward. And my point is really well; these are different issues, um, and they're different in a number of ways. And so we shouldn't be so surprised right. um, that that they're not. Uh, Marching in lockstep. Let's talk about the other points you bring up, where you say that uh, same-sex marriage is something that men want. Um, yeah. And, well, you know, right, yeah. Ahead. Well, I think that's really, I, I think that that's very true, that if it were just, and I, I have to say, I'm totally in support of marriage equality. I think it's a civil right. It's, it's very, it's, you know, we need to have it. Um, but, you know, there's just no question in my mind, at least, that if only lesbians wanted to get married... <laughs> We wouldn't be here. It would just be, oh, yeah, these strange women over there, they want to get married. It would not be a national issue. Um, but, even, and the, but even the vernacular gay marriage types it as a male concern. That's, right. how, it's, you know, that's how it is in the, in the mind of people, even though actually lesbians are more likely to marry than gay men and, and a lot of important um, lawyers and people in the equal marriage movement are lesbians. Um, but, you know, and gay men have a certain amount of social and economic power. Um, I've been reminded that gay men make less than straight men, and okay, but that's averaged out. There are a lot of, there are now a lot of powerful gay men in the world. I, I gotta, t- um, I gotta and tell you. they have used it to mainstream this cause, I, I and gotta, more power to them. I, I gotta tell you, I think from, from my perspective... Uh, no, and, and I want to go through the rest of these, um, these mm-hmm. differences, but that to me is the fundamental one is that, um, it, it, it centers around, uh, money and, um, and, 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 and let's circle back to that because I will just, I'll just put like a, a flag there because I, because at the end of the day, I mean, this is a question about the, the success of, of, of activists to really in a, I mean, obviously, it's a long time coming, but in terms of where we were in 2004, let's say, versus today, it is 
a stunning reversal, at least from a sort of a statutory standpoint. Um, and uh, so uh, let's I want to come back to that because I want to talk about these other aspects that you that you mentioned. Uh, marriage equality has a cross class appeal. What do you mean by that? Well, anybody can have a gay child, an LGBT child. And I think parents want across the political spectrum want their kids to have the same opportunities as their children. Look at the Cheneys, you know, you can't get more right wing than that. And they supported their lesbian daughter. Their other daughter didn't support her, but, you know, the parents did. Um, and that, that's very significant, I think. There have been a number of prominent Republicans who have discovered that their child was gay or someone in their, else in their family was gay. And, uh, and that's really opened up their eyes pretty quickly. Now, what's interesting is any woman might find herself needing an abortion, too, um, but she may not realize that. I think a lot of women think, and a lot of men involved with women, think, oh, well, that's never going to happen to us. You know, we're using birth control, and we're special, wonderful people, and abortions are just for sluts and poor people. Um, they don't understand how common abortion is, one in three women. But um, isn't it also, too, that if I'm wealthy, it really doesn't matter? Like, well, I mean, in terms of yeah. like, in terms of like, you know, things like curtailing access to abortion, because I've got money. Like it, there's it seems to me that there's never been a well, I don't know about never been. But for the most part, when we talk about um, uh, l abortion being legal and found to be a right, that opened up abortion to people who were not wealthy. <laughs> right. I mean, that it was well, always available if you had the money. Well. First of all, it was always available, but it might not be safe. Illegal, generally, you don't want to have illegal medical procedures performed right, on right. you. There were a lot of middle class and even upper class women who had real, uh, you know, uh, got into real physical trouble over illegal abortions, which could also be very degrading um, and hugely expensive and all the rest of it. So, you know, I think. Uh, people say what, what you've just said. That's a very common idea. But, you know, what if you're a working woman? I mean, there's, you know, it's not just that, like you're really low income or you're really rich. There are a lot of people still in the middle. Those women may not believe that it's going to be hard for them to find an abortion, but they're going to have a big surprise because there you are in, let's say, Missouri at, at one end of the state, and you've got a job, you've got kids, maybe your husband isn't so keen on what you're doing, um, and all of a sudden... Your privacy is gone because arranging a three-day trip is not very right. easy to do when you're a married person without them wondering what you're up to. You've got to, you know, it raises the cost tremendously. It makes it more difficult, more stressful, more awful. Um, and I just think that um, people don't really understand what it's going to be like. But there's another thing too, Sam, which is that all this is happening in a very kind of uh, geographically distinct kind of way so that what you find is the states where the most pro-choice women live like New York or California um, big cities that's where you can most easily get an abortion right you know so that these red states where the big problems are um, uh, you know they they're far from media markets I mean when was the last time you read a, a story about South Dakota well um, I mean, you know, in uh, every way, yesterday, think, in my instance, yeah. but uh, but but yes, in the main, yes, I in agree. the main, you know, or Wyoming, which doesn't have any clinics. Right. Um, these are out of the way places uh, where uh, that are that are red states. And so it's a little harder for people living in New York uh, to realize what's going on. After all, I mean, we are one country in the end, and things that start in those places don't stay there. Indeed. Indeed. I mean, I think um, a huge percentage of this show is about um, talking about some insane right winger in uh, South Dakota introducing something to the legislature. And then three years later, we see that it's being adopted in, in uh, uh, you know, in, in North Carolina and in uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's yes. um, Ohio is now a very big anti-choice state. Um, and Ohio is, you know, it's it's not some obscure little corner of the country. Um, uh, let, Pennsylvania, let's talk, 
let's talk about your last point. Uh, in marriage mm-hmm. equality, there is no loser. Uh, but uh, you say, but including some who call themselves pro-choice feel that the abortion creates a loser, the embryo or the fetus. Um, uh, expand on that, because my perception is that explicitly for those who are against marriage equality, and it is a tough argument to buy for, you know, for rational people, but um, that uh, you're, you're harming marriage if you open it up to just about anybody. I know, but that's what, you know, that is what they say. But they have never been able to make that very persuasive no. to anyone who didn't belong to specific religious denominations right. and the specific end, you know, conservative ends of those denominations. You just can't explain how your gay marriage hurts my straight marriage. Um, if they could do that, uh, they might have a better shot at winning in the Supreme Court. Um, but the thing about reproductive rights is they come, they come with there are two things. One is, unlike gay marriage, which costs society nothing and takes no power away from anyone, reproductive rights do come with a price tag. This is health care, and that means government funding is inevitably involved. And that means people get to say things like this one New Hampshire lawmaker, I quote, if you want to have a party, have a party, but don't ask me to pay for it. And that was about contraception. Um, so, uh, and uh, contraception but isn't, isn't that guy, yeah. I mean, I don't know if that guy in particular, but when people say that, aren't they really, aren't they really just saying like, I'm going to cynically pretend this is actually about cost when in fact... You know, we spend more on I don't know, um, you know, the the urinal cakes than than we spend on that stuff practically. Well, you could well be right. Um, I don't want to speculate about people's motives, but it certainly sounds like that guy is not a fan of of women having sex. Um, right. But um, the point is, because birth control and abortion do place demands on the state and on the taxpayer that allows a way for people who are opposed to those things to uh, make it harder for them to get. And that doesn't work with, mar- with right. gay marriage. Gay marriage doesn't cost anybody anything. And so it's, you know, it's you, those whole things, like, it, with all, like what Hobby Lobby was about, was does this employer have to pay, you know, have to, have to provide, sorry, have to provide um, contraception, certain forms of contraception that he believes are abortifacients, uh, on his employees' health insurance, and the Supreme Court said, you don't have to do that. That's an invasion of your rights. Um, now, he couldn't make that point about his employees getting having same-sex marriages, you know? They're not asking him for anything. Um, so, so it's different in that way. But I want to get to your other point, which is that... Um, uh, there's no loser in gay marriage, but in abortion rights, not contraception, but abortion rights, um, there, even for some pro-choice people, they do feel, well, yeah, there is another, there's another interest in here, that of the embryo or the fetus. And I, what I say is you have to value women a lot to side with the pregnant woman with all her inevitable, complicated story, her complexities, her flaws, over the p- future baby, which is just, which is pure potentiality. It has no, it has no character or personality or motives. Um, there's nothing you can judge there, whereas we love to judge women. Yeah, I mean, let's, t- I mean, let's uh, expand upon that a little bit, because that's sort of, we're getting into um, the, the theme of, of your book, and, and, and I want to touch on that, because this is, you know, the, um, I am of the, that mind that this is, um, that it is problematic in terms of the struggle to maintain women's rights um, in terms of sovereignty over their own body. Um, it's problematic to uh, to concede that abortion is this sort of like thing that should be legal, but is but is necessarily icky. I mean, it is, um, you know, I mean, I think for me, going to the dentist is also pretty icky. Uh, and and I'm not, uh, you know, it, it's 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 slightly more invasive, I think, uh, to to get an abortion. But um, it's. 
I, I think it's it has to be seen in the context of, of of a medical procedure, but one that also is incredibly that allows women to have power in our society that they have been denied for uh, well a long time. Yes, um, that's all true. Um, now you know people have a lot of ideas about abortion, like when you say icky, for example, that don't really hold up. For example, I think partly because of the brilliance of the anti-choice messaging with remember partial birth abortion, where it really did look like you know a, a one-year-old. You know, um, the people think of abortion now as a late procedure, they, but it isn't. Most abortions, 80%, take place in the first trimester. They take place when, you know, it, it, it doesn't look like a baby. Um, uh, a lot of abortion now, and more would happen this way if, if it weren't for laws preventing it, are medication abortions where you take a pill. Um, in the first eight weeks of pregnancy, eight or nine weeks of pregnancy, you know that does that is that icky? I don't know. I, I don't think I would say it was. Um, so, you know, I think if we kind of uh, but, if we sort of looked more at what abortion really concretely involves, when it happens, and why it happens, we might feel differently about it. But when you make that when you when you make that argument. Too though, aren't you opening the door to um, to people to focus on the other twenty percent? Right. I um, mean, I mean, isn't that? I mean, isn't I mean? I mean that's, it seems to me to be like sort of their strategy. I mean, uh, you know, I hate to keep going back to that, but it, when we were talking to Signorelli yesterday, he said that the next sort of uh, front in terms of marriage equality, the the right wingers are already equating to uh, late term uh, late term. Uh, 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 abortion, that they want to sort of like begin to chip away at stuff. Um, wait, the, that you're saying that the well, that anti-marriage they, people are talking about late-term abortion? They are, I, they're coming up, they, they want to come up with their version of... Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I think they might have a hard time doing that, because either you're married or you're not married, right? Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the uh, it's true that about 20% of abortions take place after the first, well, it's actually less than that, um, after the first trimester. But, you know, but very, very few, like less than 1% take place after 24 weeks. And then, you know, the state is allowed to say, you know, that you can't have a third trimester abortion except to protect your, the woman's health and life. So, you know, this picture people have of women just showing up, you know, a day before birth and saying, oh, I've changed my mind. This is completely ridiculous. Um, there are actually three clinics in the whole country where you could get a third trimester abortion. Um, and you have to go to this place. Those are the places in, um, uh, profiled in that very interesting documentary, uh, After Killer, um, it's really a big deal to get a very, you know, a very late abortion. And usually there's some problem with, with the mother or with the fetus. Um, it's not just something people suddenly wake up and decide to do. Um, so let, let me just uh, turn back to my theory on, on, on the difference and get your take on this. Because I, mean, I think to a certain extent you touch on it when it's, it's something that, that men want. But it occurs to me that the real dynamic here, and this is sort of like where I've landed on, on why um, a marriage equality has been so much more successful than, say, like, I don't know, expansion of Social Security, just uh, for instance, which has mm -hmm. huge uh, poll numbers, right? Um, is that fundamentally, when we talk about marriage equality, we have a tremendous amount of money out there. And it may be the case that the average um, uh, gay man makes less than the average heterosexual man. But there are, are, there are big millionaires, multimillionaires, perhaps billionaires, who are gay, who have lined up and basically put the money down on the table. And it, it, in, in contrast... I mean, you touched on this, that you have um, uh, women's rights to choose being chipped away outside of places like New York and California, where to the extent that there's big money 
uh, from women to to uh, to to fight against that. It, it is you know it's it's much harder to motivate someone like you've got to make sure that people in Missouri have access to this. Whereas on a daily basis in New York, you realize that there's, there's, there's plenty of access. I mean, it seems to me that at the end of the day, it's really about money, which, you know, then maybe sort of subsidiary to that is who makes money in our society. Um, well, I think money plays a role in everything. <laughs> I think that's really true. I mean, you mentioned, for example, uh, expanding Social Security. Um, which would, you know, which would cost money, but people, you know, a lot of people support it, but it would be a big burden on the state, right? And uh, so there are people that are very strongly against that, the people who think, yeah, government should be small, we don't want all these freeloaders, all the rest. Um, once money comes into uh, to politics, I think a lot of things change. And one thing we haven't talked about, though, is stigma. Now, in, to be gay is still in many places very stigmatizing, but that's really on the way down. You have a lot of people, a lot of celebrities, for example, coming out as gay, um, or even now coming out as trans with, uh, with Bruce Jenner. Um, but you don't have so many celebrities coming out and saying, yeah, I had an abortion, or, I mean, you have a few, um, or, uh, you know, yes, um, I paid for my girlfriend's abortion, no, it's just a more stigmatized thing. But there's um, also a sense, it also seems to me to be a lack of urgency that um, is, you know, that is, that is driving that. In other words, you know, in terms of when I've spoken to, to, to people about that, the sort of that, the, the um, you know, that dynamic of people coming out and, and, and announcing that they're, uh, they're gay or coming out and, and, and saying that they're uh, transgender. It is part of it is driven by the fact that like, look, you know, you have uh, some uh, uh, kid in uh, Mississippi who is, you know, contemplating suicide. And yeah. because they don't have a sense that they have a sense that there's something fundamentally wrong with them. And it's incumbent upon, uh, people who, um, you know, who are gay or are trans to come out and, and, and say, it's okay to be this way. Yeah. And, and, and that's right. going to have an impact. There, that dynamic does not to seem to be in place, or at least there isn't well, this that is level what we of need. This is one. This is one reason I wrote my book. <laughs> you know? you're, you're really zeroing in because I think that the shame that women feel about abortion, that they are made to feel by society and by their parents and by, you know, by their friends sometimes, um, and certainly by, uh, you know, many organized religions, um, I think that this is a very important piece of the problem, that if you can't acknowledge, oh, yeah, I did that, and it was the right decision, and my life is better now, if you can't say that, then you are politically silenced. You can't uh, get together with other people in the same situation who might be your friends, you know. Uh, you don't know whether your friends have had abortions or not a lot of the time um, because they're not telling you. And so everybody then feels like, oh, let's just stay away from that. Let's just stay away from that issue. And that's why with some... Sorry, go on. No, well, I was going to say that context when you're talking about friends is really where the delineation is, because I can understand why an actress doesn't, uh, you know, here's my interview with E, and uh, I'm not going to say, oh, incidentally, I had an abortion. There's nothing sort of compelling that. But in the context of when you're talking to your friends, uh, it, there's it, you don't necessarily need the same things to compel you to tell you things to your friends. You tell them because you're your friends. It's something you experienced. Uh, you know, I tell my friends when I go, uh, you know, uh, get a colonoscopy, I, maybe I tell too many people, but mm -hmm. the, the point being that, um, the dynamic on uh, there's, there's that much more sort of, uh, weighing against you telling people, even in the, in the, in the context of a private conversation when it's theoretically not political. Right. And, you know, there is another distinction too, which is being, which you kind of got to a little bit, uh, which is. Being gay is something that you are. You're gay every day. You know, you're a lesbian every day. But an abortion is a one-time uh, experience in your life, and you, you can put it behind you. It doesn't define you um, unless you tell the wrong person, <laughs> you know? Right. So um, you can see why uh, women would just want to just 
be quiet about it. But I'm, what I'm saying is that that being quiet, that fear, uh, uh, allows stigma to flourish. Uh, a lot of people, and there's sociologist uh, Sarah Cowan who studied this, a lot of people think they don't know anyone who's had an abortion. But they're probably wrong. Um, they probably do know people who've had an abortion, but that person isn't telling them because people are very careful who they tell. Um, and they're not going to tell someone that they think is going to judge them. But what that means is that anti people who oppose abortion have a false idea of who has them. You know, they think, oh, that doesn't happen in my community. Um, that doesn't happen to good Christians. That doesn't happen to people like me. Um, but they're probably wrong. Right. And it also just the fact that people are not telling them almost sort of per- 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 perpetuates that stigma on some level. And when exactly. there's a stigma there, you assume that there's something wrong with it, even if it's uh, it's a necessary evil or something is, is the way that people. All right. Well, Kath, l- before we go, let me ask you this, because everything now we're now at that uh, time of uh, the uh, of our, our our lives where everything is seen through a prism of the election. And of course, um, we have um, a, a very viable uh, chance at having a our first uh, woman president. Uh, Hillary Clinton, when I think of, of, of Hillary Clinton's evolution, one of the things that I think of is, I think it was around 2004, where she was sort of on team and very, I think, relatively vocal about this idea of abortions are icky, but uh, necessary, but maybe we can sort of mitigate them in some way. I mean, is yeah. that, is well, that I, an accurate I would... assessment? I, mean, because... I wouldn't say that she said icky. I, I actually think icky is a word that maybe men use about female biology that women don't use. Well, I'm saying icky. Biology. But not I'm saying distracted. icky, not. No, I'm not saying icky distracted. because I'm actually sort of parroting that 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 yeah. that, that. What thing. she said was, abortion is a, is you know we have to keep it legal, but it's a, we have to also acknowledge it's a tragic choice for many many women. Um, well, it's a tragic choice for some women. I don't think it's a tragic choice for all that many women. I think. Studies have shown women are 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 okay. But what is it? What does that mean? Even but, like a tragic choice? Well, what I think it? she meant that when she was talking. Well, I don't want to speak for her. I think what she meant may have been that there are women who would like to have a baby, but they can't have the baby because of circumstances beyond their control, and so they have an abortion. Um, and I don't think we have any idea how many women would fit that bill. There are also a lot of women who want to have abortions and they can't get them. Um, especially, uh, you know, because of all these restrictions, because it isn't covered by Medicaid, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but, uh, and she did say back then, you know, uh, we have to push adoption. That's going to make a difference. Adoption is never going to make a difference in the number of people who have abortions, because adoption is not a choice that very many women want to make. It's, it's tiny, actually. Um, so anyway, uh, I'm glad that she's moving away from that way of talking about abortion, because I think that way of talking about abortion was not helpful. I think it was stigmatizing. Yeah, I mean, to say that it's tragic, it seems to me that that is a very problematic way. I mean, that that runs like counter to, I think, like, I mean, to your whole argument on some level, too. Well, it can be tragic if you want, if you want to have a baby. Let's say you want to have a baby, and you're, you're going along in your pregnancy, and then it turns out there's some you know, your baby doesn't have a brain, your baby is anencephalic, and rather than go through the pregnancy and watch your baby die, you decide to have a termination. But that can be, that's very painful, that is tragic. Oh, I have no doubt that there are tragic um, scenarios so, yeah. around that. Like, I, I mean, I can imagine it's a tragic scenario that uh, you and uh, your husband decide that uh, now's not that time to have a, a, a child, uh, we can do it, uh, we'll do it, we'll have a child later, and then your husband gets on an airplane and crashes, and that's tragic, too. I'm saying, though, when you go out there and you say that that's a tragic choice for women, uh, the, there's no... I, I can come up with a scenario on any choice that anybody could make that, that is, in some instances, mm-hmm. tragic. But th- it is not a tragic choice. It is a simply I agree a with choice. you. Right. I agree with you completely. I think that, I, you know, I criticized her for saying that at the time. Um, and I think that those were, um, you know, th- that was a sort of weaselly way to talk about abortion. And I don't think it helped um, keep abortion available. But, you know, the whole thing, the Clintons had that phrase, remember, safe 
legal and rare. Right. And I didn't like that either because the point isn't whether abortion is rare or common. The point is, is it accessible? We might find that if every woman who wanted an abortion could could get one without a whole, you know, jumping through all those hoops, uh, that there was more, that the, there were more, there was more abortion. Right. Um, and as long, I mean, and then you would want to say, well, gee, we really need to do something about that birth control situation here, you know, and the, sex, the, the element of sexual ignorance and coercion and manipulation and everything that goes on. Um, but we wouldn't say, oh, this number is the problem number. Right. Um, it's not about numbers. It's about, um, it's about freedom and access and being able to make a good decision for yourself. Well, Katha Pollitt, um, the, uh, the piece is there's a reason a gay marriage is winning uh, while abortion rights are, uh, are losing. And, of course, uh, we will put a link to your most recent book, and we'll put a link to all your books. Oh, uh, thank you. And, uh, and your column at majority.fm. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me on the show. Bye-bye. It was fun.